Members, I call the Honourable Stuart Nash. on your election to a most esteemed position in this House. I decided very early on not to raise the ghost of a past Nash, long buried in time and memory, but whose footsteps still haunt this place. For even though he wandered these halls for 40 years, that was, after all, 40 years ago. However, as I make my way around the corridors of this wonderful old building, I cannot help but notice the giants of past eras have never been laid to rest as their photos are there to inspire us, encourage and to remind us of the proud legacy that we carry as a Labour Party team dedicated to always asking, as Harry Holland, the first leader of the Labour Party did, is it right? Harry Holland realised that if it was right for the people of New Zealand, it would be right for the New Zealand Labour Party. This underlying principle of whether it is right for New Zealand people has guided all our Prime Ministers from Joe Savage to Helen Clark, and I hope in less than three years, Phil Goff. It is with a sense of honour and pride, but also, I must admit, a degree of nervousness and trepidation that I start my parliamentary career. And I hope that I can live up to the memory and expectations of past members, for the privilege of being a Labour Party MP is one of a very proud history. There are numerous powers that lead to this chamber, but none of us would be here without the patronage and support of those who encourage us and mentor us to this position. First and foremost, I must convey my thanks to the Honourable Dr Michael Cullen. For without, for without his support, I would not be here. I acknowledge this and hope he knows that it is greatly appreciated. But behind every successful man, there is a surprised woman. And Michael's partner, Anne Collins, I am sure, would agree with this statement. Anne, Raywin Barry, Tom Wilson, Jeff Braybrook, Bill Sutton, Guy Wellwood, and all those that have, who have supported and encouraged me, I salute you and thank you with all my heart, especially as my arrival in Napier around 18 months ago reminded me of a Winston Churchill quote. When the great man was asked, doesn't it thrill you to know that every time you give a political speech, the hall is packed to overflowing? It's quite flattering, he replied. But whenever I feel that way, I always remember that if instead of giving a political speech, I was being hanged, the crowd would be twice as big. <laughs> Napier is also where my story begins. A little longer than a little while ago, so it's nice to come here and be called a young, fresh face. And who said the media was all bad? My family history in the Bay begins around 1865. My daughter is actually the fifth generation of our family to attend Napier Central School, right back to its founding over 130 years ago. Napier is, without a doubt, one of the best, if not the best city in New Zealand. It has the climate, it has the fruit, it has the wine, it has the beaches, the architecture and art deco, and it has a rugby team that has beaten the Waikato the last four times they have played. <laughs> The only thing it doesn't have is a Labour constituent MP. But we're working on that, we're working on that. My father, Hal Nash, is a wonderful man who practised the principles of social democracy during a long legal career better than anyone I know. And my mother, Jenny Nash, had four children under five at one stage. And it's a testament to her strength of character and fortitude that she is still completely sound of mind. A wonderful upbringing I had where the summers were long, hot and sunny, and school days at Napier Central School, Napier Intermediate and Napier Boys High, fun. Now they say that politics is in the blood, but I don't believe that. Politics is in the heart and in the soul, and in our family it was around the dinner table. But perhaps the one person who shaped, or first shaped my political leaning was that great social democrat Elvis Presley. <laughs> and it wasn't to do, it wasn't, Mr Speaker, to do with his unique solutions to prison reform or his yearning for social justice and equity in the ghetto or even animal rights for bad dogs. No, unfortunately for me, he died on the very same day that the Right Honourable Sir Robert Muldoon delivered a budget. And the day before, I had to present a news item in front of my classmates. 
Five nine-year-olds spoke about Elvis Presley. One poor chap spoke about the government's fiscal plans. <laughs> Thanks, Mum. I have bad memories of Muldoon for a whole lot more reasons than most in my party. But the advice my father gave me when I showed a real interest in politics was get educated and get some experience to take into the house. So a few universities later, a little experience in a couple of industries finds me here living my passion and my dream. However, just recently when my father was asked if he was proud of me, he said that it was a dreadful job that I had chosen. But I did not come here looking for a job, Mr Speaker, but because of a calling. I liked my fellow newbie's Phil Twyford's line when he said that some of us will be remembered, but most of us won't. But to be remembered is not what motivates us. If I can leave this house for the final time in the knowledge that my party's legacy has made a positive difference to the lives of all New Zealanders who call New Zealand home, then I will have accomplished my goals and ambitions. It is why Helen Clark and Michael Cullen and all of you who have served in the fifth Labour government will be talked about fondly by future scholars historians and New Zealanders alike around the dinner tables and barbecues. Because my beautiful daughter Sophia and my wonderful son Charles are growing up in a better world due to the tireless work, energy and legacy of this wonderful party I am proud to be a member of. And this place is not called a house for nothing. We spend an inordinate amount of time here. There is a bed in my office, there is a kitchen outside my door, and the father of the house is in the room adjacent. I wondered if the senior whip, Darren Hughes, was trying to tell me something when he allocated me this office, but then realised the message actually wasn't that subtle at all, when in the first two weeks we were obliged to be here until midnight most nights. But the Labour caucus is a family, and not just because we live, work and eat in the same house under one roof, but because our differences unite us in a common belief and a philosophy that forces us to always ask, is it right? And then we do what is right. In a previous life, I travelled overseas for business. And whilst I enjoyed the job, I found the international travel was real tonic for the soul. And I say that because whenever I flew into Auckland Airport, I realised just how lucky I was living in this wonderful country. Our beaches are pristine. Our skyline visible, our fields green, our different coloured children playing together in our many parks, and our families interacting side by side, regardless of socio-economic status, enjoying a champagne lifestyle, regardless of what is in the chilli bin or on the barbie. I see myself, Mr Speaker, as first and foremost a public servant, employed by the people of New Zealand to represent this country and its citizens. I am available to help all those for whom my help is either requested or required, regardless of sex, race, age or political affiliation. I am also a proud Social Democrat who will work hard to develop a regulatory environment that encourages sustainable economic development and growth through increasing our international competitiveness by developing trade partnerships and models that not only encourage but promote our companies to seek further offshore opportunities, and that allows New Zealand's competitive advantage to be clearly articulated and understood by all with whom we seek trade alliances. Nice political speak, but what it actually means, in plain English, is that the number eight why mentality and the shield we write attitude that we have prided ourselves on to date is no longer good enough in the 21st century. To reach the top these days, we need to be very smart exceptionally well prepared, intensely focused and willing to stand up and fight for what we believe in with all our energy. Handing out replica all black jerseys is no longer good enough to clinch the deal. I also know that unrestrained and unregulated economic growth can have a negative effect on a country's well-being. This can occur when, for example, those in the workforce have diminished or oppressed rights and we have seen this in the very first week of this government. 
when investors and markets are being deliberately or negligently misled or manipulated, and when scarce resources are exploited. It is the philosophical mandate and governance role of any social democratic party <coughs> to ensure that the <coughs> negative social and moral effects of economic growth are mitigated through information communication, sound policy, justifiable regulation and wise legislation. But for Pat McGill, a community hero who spends his days advocating for prison reform and helping and supporting those who need his help and support outside Napier Prison every day, he just wants to know that we are still asking ourselves Harry's question, is it right? A friend of mine said to me recently, the time had now come to adopt a new economic model. However, the time is not right for simple adoption, but time for invention and development of a new economic paradigm that takes into account the expectations of 21st century New Zealanders. Friedman is dead. The economic philosophies of the laissez-faire practitioners have finally been laid to rest and cremated in the ashes of the current economic crisis. This is why I was so disappointed with the speech from the throne, because it talks about aspiration, and yet there was nothing substantive to deliver it. It mentioned productivity, and yet there was nothing concrete to drive it. It was not visionary at a time when we're beginning to develop our own global identity and struggling to a certain extent to understand our place on this earth. History has proven that the only party to really deliver significant gains for the people of New Zealand is the New Zealand Labour Party. We are and always have been a party of social evolution, if not revolution. We work to build, to empower, to create and practice fiscal accountability as well as social responsibility. We work as a collective more powerful than one, as one, than we can ever be as individuals, quite simply because we always ask, is it right? I'm very optimistic about the long-term future of our party because when I look around our caucus room, I see an awesome array of experience, mixing, helping, and mentoring the new. But quite simply, we are just 43 New Zealanders, full of energy, competence, and a belief in the principles and philosophies of social democracy, and a willingness to work hard and create a better New Zealand. It's the most aspirational team I have ever had the humble pleasure to be part of. I would like to finish by quoting what John F. Kennedy wrote shortly before his assassination, because I think that it sums up this Labour caucus and its leadership under Phil Goff and Annette King. <coughs> if we are strong, our strength will speak for itself. If we are weak, our words will be of no help. And believe me, this caucus and its leaders are strong. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.